Tom Hartman here with you. It is Friday. It is time for Senator Bernie Sanders Brunch with Bernie. Bernie, welcome. Good to be with you, Tom. Great to have you with us. Uh, we have been watching austerity rack the EU, yet Republicans are still pushing this. J.P. Morgan goes down in flames. You've been in on these hearings on AIDS, drugs, and you were at a rally this week. We had you on on Wednesday. List. I'm just curious, your thoughts on what's going on in the world in the week? Well, it is a, uh, it's been a very busy week. And let's start off with the issue of austerity. I think what we are seeing, Tom, is throughout Europe, uh, not only in France, uh, but in Germany, where in the last couple of weeks there have been a number of elections, uh, in Greece, uh, people are beginning to catch on uh, that austerity for working families who are already seeing uh, a significant decline in their standard of living, very, very high unemployment rates, that maybe instead of austerity for ordinary people, it's time we had austerity for the big banks and for the wealthiest people in this country and, in fact, in the world who are doing phenomenally well. Uh, here in the United States, uh, our right-wing Republican friends are pushing unbelievable austerity measures uh, onto the floor of the House and the Senate. Uh, we have the Ryan budget, which was overwhelmingly voted for by Republicans uh, in the Senate, and that surprised me. I didn't know that it would get uh, as many uh, votes as it did. Uh, the Ryan budget uh, would end Medicare as we know it, converted into a, a voucher program. Uh, it would throw a minimum of 14 million men, women, and children off of Medicaid. It would slash education and Head Start, veterans' health care, and many, many other programs that ordinary people uh, depend upon. So our Republican friends say that the way to move toward a balanced budget is to go full tilt uh, against the needs of working families, the elderly, the children, uh, the sick, and the poor. Meanwhile, uh, they want to continue giving tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires, despite the fact that we have every day more and more income and wealth inequality in America. Uh, the last study that I have seen in terms of income inequality uh, showed that in 2010, as compared to 2009, this is the last study that we've seen, 93% of all new income went to the top 1%. Almost all of the economic growth, all the new income went to the people on the very, very top. But this apparently is not good enough for some of our Republican colleagues who want to move toward a balanced budget by destroying Medicare as we know it, uh, making cuts in Social Security, Medicaid, education, uh, health care, etc. So that is, to me, domestically, the major issue that we're going to have to be watching and fighting. We're going to have to stand up to right-wing extremism there uh, and demand that if we want to move toward a balanced budget in a way that is fair, you know what, not only do we not give more tax breaks to the wealthy and large corporations, we start asking these guys to stop paying their fair share uh, of taxes. We take a hard look at military spending. As a nation, we now spend uh, more on defense than the rest of the world combined. So there are ways to move toward a, a balanced budget. There are ways to move to deal with deficit reduction, but it absolutely does not and must not be on the backs of the most vulnerable people in this country. And furthermore, of course, our highest priority must be to create the millions of jobs this country desperately needs. And we can do that uh, by rebuilding our infrastructure, transforming our energy system, changing our trade policies. There are ways to do that. So that whole issue of austerity and cutbacks and Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is very much on, on uh, my uh, to-do list uh, to pay attention to and to fight against. Uh, so that's one issue. The second issue that I uh, wanted to say a word on, is I think uh, many people are aware that uh, J.P. Morgan Chase uh, recently gambled away uh, over $2 billion. They lost it on a bet. And what really gets me going on that, Tom, is here you have this country in the midst of a major recession. 23 million Americans are unemployed or underemployed. Businesses all over this country are in desperate need of affordable loans. Uh, and you have Wall Street continuing to do what they did before the meltdown, and that is engage in very complicated betting uh, and, and wager procedures. Uh, to my mind, uh, what we need to do 
uh, is we need to re-regulate Wall Street, of course, bring back Glass-Steagall, but most importantly, and more and more people are beginning to talk about that, not just progressives, some conservatives as well. you got the six largest financial institutions in this country having assets equivalent to two-thirds of the GDP of America, over $9 trillion, Tom. Six financial institutions. And this means that these guys are producing about half of the mortgages in America, two-thirds of the credit cards in this country. And I think if Teddy Roosevelt were alive today, Teddy Roosevelt being a good old Republican boy back in the early 1900s, what Roosevelt would have said is, it's time to break these institutions up. They're too big. They're too powerful. They're going to lead us down the path, I fear, to another uh, too-big-to-fail bailout, and they have a negative impact on the economy because of their size. So that's an issue we are paying a whole lot of attention to, and what we're going to be doing next week is introducing legislation uh, in terms of Fed reform, which will prevent uh, the CEOs uh, and other people of the financial industry uh, from sitting on the regional Feds. Right now, our friend Dave, uh, Jamie, uh, uh, Jamie Dimon is, the, uh, is on the New York Fed. So you have the absurd situation where the head of the largest financial institution in this country is sitting on the New York Fed, whose job in life is supposedly to regulate large financial institutions. Now, if that's not a conflict uh, of interest, uh, I'm not quite sure what is. Uh, last point that I want to uh, mention is uh, I know a lot of people over the last number of weeks have called up about the post office, another issue we've worked very hard on. Uh, is uh, I hope people know the Senate passed what I thought was a pretty good bill. It didn't go as far as I would like, but it was a reasonable bill. Uh, the Postmaster General, I think, in response to that legislation uh, and in response to an outcry from the unions, from people all over this country, modified uh, his draconian principles, which originally nine months ago called for the shutting down over a period of a few years, uh, some 13 or 14,000 rural post offices and half of the processing plants in this country. So he's been slowed down. Instead of shutting down uh, the, the rural post offices, uh, what he has now done is cut back on hours of service. Not my, uh, not what I would like to see, but certainly better than seeing uh, towns all over this country lose their post offices completely. And also he has uh, uh, he has cut back on uh, processing plants, but not as many as he had originally uh, intended to. So uh, we have not certainly won that. A battle, but we have modified uh, significantly what the Postmaster General originally had in mind. But Bernie, we have about 30 seconds before the break. Do you think that this legislation that passed the Senate is going to make it through the Republican-controlled House? Uh, hard to say. Uh, we have support there. Uh, the chairman of the relevant committee, a gentleman named Mr. Iser, is strongly opposed. He would prefer, for all intents and purposes, to privatize uh, the You're talking about Daryl Issa? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And that's where these guys are coming from. But on the other hand, you got a lot of folks who understand how important a strong post office is for the American economy and for rural America uh, especially. So we have some support, uh, and we're working with colleagues in the House uh, to see if we can get it up on the floor and get it passed. Okay. Well, I, I wish you the very best in that, and, and good on you for getting it through the Senate. Senator Bernie Sanders is with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour here on the Tom Hartman Program. Bernie will be taking your calls for the rest of the hour, 866-987-THOM. You can also check out his website over at sanders.senate.gov, where you can sign up for his newsletter, The Bernie Buzz, and you can sign his constitutional amendment to reverse Citizens United. This is the Tom Hartman Program. You can also drop into our website. You can drop into our free live chat room, post messages on our free message board, create your own blog, all of it over at tomhartman.com as well. Welcome back. And uh, Becky in Deal Island, Maryland, watching us on Dish Network on Free Speech TV. Becky, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Senator Sanders. Um, I'm a big fan of yours. I lived in New Hampshire for 31 years. I'm now in Mar- uh, Maryland. And I'm really um, upset about what I just heard uh, from Chris Hedges, that you voted for the NDAA on New Year's Eve when the the uh, House and the Senate passed it when the people were real busy. 
and what happened yesterday the in New York. NDAA. The National Defense Authorization no, Act. No, actually, I voted against it. Yeah, you, you said you voted for it. No, I, I couldn't against believe it. I was Chris, really stunned. Chris, Chris was wrong if he said that, Becky. Yeah. He said that on yeah. RT not ten minutes ago. Huh. Um, well, somebody should correct him. Okay. Well, that was why I was calling. I was uh, uh, really quite upset to have our first, fourth, and fifth amendment violated, and what happened yesterday well, in New York. To that for two reasons. Reasons. Sure. Holding it. Becky, uh, here's Bernie wants to answer yeah. this. I voted against that for two reasons. Uh, first, um, I share the concern that you have just raised about the attack on civil liberties. Uh, and the second concern that I have, which people do not talk about anywhere near enough, is the size of the military budget. Uh, and those were the two reasons that I voted against it. I think we're going to have to take a hard look. If we're serious about deficit reduction, uh, we're going to have to take a hard look at military spending and get rid of uh, weapon systems and other programs uh, that this country uh, doesn't need. Okay. Jim in Willits, California, watching us on Dish Network on Free Speech TV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, is this me? It's you. I would like to thank you both for doing what you do first, and then say I'm looking at a website, Disabled Veterans, and I'm really concerned about the uh, the situation with the Veterans Court nominees. Uh, it says, the headline is, Merry Christmas, Veterans Court nominations postponed indefinitely. I was wondering what's going on in the Senate with that. Uh, is there any hope that we can fill those positions sometime? The backlog of claims that... About a million now. I see a real problem. Well, you, you're identifying uh, maybe the most serious problem that the VA has. Uh, I think General Shinseki, who is now head of the Veterans Administration, recognizes that. Uh, my understanding is the VA has hired a whole lot of new people in order to deal with that backlog. Uh, what the caller is referring to is that when veterans now apply for a, a, a benefit, it takes sometimes just much, much, much too long for that process, the paperwork to go through. So it is an issue. Uh, I know that uh, General Shinseki is more than aware of it. We've talked about it on a number of occasions, uh, and uh, I hope that we're going to make some significant progress on it in the short term. Is uh, Bernie, we just have uh, 30 seconds or so here. Is this, before the break, is this a court that adjudicates uh, claims that are in dispute against the Veterans Administration? Is that, well, I is think... That? Uh, that may be, yeah, that may be its function, but I don't think that is the primary reason. Um, I mean, you're talking about tens and tens and tens of thousands of claims out there, so sure. it's not like a Supreme Court deciding. Yeah. But it is, uh, the key problem is I think they've lacked personnel to deal with what sometimes are pretty complicated issues. Hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. He'll be back taking your calls in just a moment here on the Tom Hartman Program on our Brunch with Bernie, our national town hall meeting with Senator Sanders. Stick around. We'll be right back. The Tom Hartman Program is brought to you in part by Solar World, solarworld.com for information on solar electricity. Talk media for the rest of us. The Tom Hartman Program, Senator Bernie Sanders on the line. Our Brunch with Bernie Hour, taking your calls in our national town hall meeting. Kathy, uh, listening hey. in Sirius Satellite Radio in Lee's Summit, Missouri. Hey, Kathy, you're on the air. Yes, Senator Sanders. I was wondering what it would take to revisit the amendments that were made to the Fair Labor Standards Act in 2004. It seems that after those were passed, so many people were classified as contract workers, therefore losing wages. My husband's in IT, and he was, there's a special carve out for IT workers. I mean, just a huge carve out for them as far as, you know, overtime and uh, wages. And I, and I read that it was tried to be revisited, but to me, if, if that could, a lot of that could be changed, we could pump more money back into the middle class. 
Well, Kathy, I think you are absolutely right. There certainly <clears throat> has been, <clears throat> excuse me, there has been discussion uh, on this very important issue. And I think what Kathy is talking about is employers are ripping off workers by making them quote unquote independent contractors rather than uh, <clears throat> employees uh, who then get the benefits that they are otherwise entitled to. Mm-hmm. So, Kathy, this is an issue that has come up. I think many of us are aware of it. Uh, but to be very honest with you, so long as you have right-wing Republicans controlling the House who are viciously anti-labor, I wouldn't hold my breath that we're going to get that through soon. Okay. Stephen in Aurora, Illinois, listening to WCPT. Hey, Stephen, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah, I'd like to know what we could do to help Senator Sanders get rid of uh, Jamie Dimon off the New York Board of uh, Federal Governors Reserves, because it seems like it's the fox guard in the hen house that that I don't care that he says a $2 billion loss is nothing because he's got $4 billion profit in a quarter. How can you explain a one-day loss that's going to eat up half your profit in a quarter and expecting the, you know, the FDIC to come in and fix them or the taxpayers to bail them out again? Well, Stephen, I think you hit it right. Uh, you hit the nail on the head. <clears throat> the issue here is that, and I, I, I hope people remember this, uh, we got an amendment uh, into Dodd-Frank, which called for the very first time an audit of the Fed, which were the years surrounding the bailout. And what we learned is, in fact, that J.P. Morgan Chase received hundreds of billions of dollars in zero or low-interest loans during that uh, bailout period, along with every other major financial institution in the country. So the issue is, when you have people sitting on the New York Fed, that's a pretty powerful position, The function of the New York Fed is to help regulate large financial institutions. As Stephen just said, if you have a guy like Jamie Dimon, the head of the largest financial institution in America, sitting on the board, which is supposed to be regulating Wall Street, if that's not a a case of the fox cutting the hen house, I don't know what is. So we're going to be introducing the legislation next week, uh, as soon as I get back. Uh, and I would hope, uh, Stephen, that you will get on the phone and others will get on the phone asking members of the Senate uh, to support uh, that legislation. John in Santa Cruz, California, watching us on Free Speech TV on Comcast. John, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, uh, Senator Sanders. I, I would like to uh, make a, re- a request about coordinating maybe your, the Postmaster General and the Attorney General to get together and make a, through the Postal Service and make a universal uh, uh, ID for voter registration. That way, the, the, this voter f- uh, fraud stuff in different states can be uh, superseded by a, by a federal uh, a federal system. Uh, interesting, um, interesting idea, John. I um, and I don't have an immediate response, but I'm not quite sure uh, that that's going to be within the jurisdiction of the postal service. But what I will say, and I and I hope everybody un- understands this. Uh, that our Republican friends are attempting to win elections in this cycle through two basic mechanisms. Number one, they strongly supported this disastrous Citizens United uh, Supreme Court decision, uh, which allows corporations to spend now as much money as they want on elections. And we're seeing the results of that uh, now in states, and we saw, certainly saw it in the Republican primaries for president. Uh, the second thing that they are doing is waging a very well-coordinated and aggressive act, uh, actions toward voter suppression, uh, toward passing laws which make it harder for lower-income people and older people to vote under the guise of trying to protect states against voter fraud. The good news for America is that voter fraud uh, virtually does not exist. Uh, and certainly if anyone uh, is involved in voter fraud, that person should be punished uh, very strongly. I, I, I consider that a serious crime. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what we should not be doing is making it harder and harder for low-income people and seniors to be voting by demanding uh, various types of ID uh, IDs uh, that people just may not have. Yeah. Al in Buffalo, New York. We have a minute to the break. Al, you're on the air. Good afternoon, Tom. Uh, how's your wife doing? She's she's getting better. Quick question for Sander, uh, Senator Sanders. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, good afternoon, Senator. Hi. Uh, I want to ask you, how do we get the message out to the American people that the, that the Republicans in, in, in Congress and the state legislators 
in the states are purposely trying to tank the economy and and you purposely i mean you said that you you've had press conferences out there but i haven't seen them and, and and how do we get the message to the to the voter out there who doesn't know anything about politics Right. It doesn't even understand. If you ask most voters out there what a, what a filibuster is, they couldn't even tell you what well, a filibuster is. Al, you raise a very, very good point. And uh, I, I think we just got to work at every single level. I think, you know, we support people like Tom Hartman, uh, who does as good a job as anybody in America in educating people about uh, what's going on politically. We knock on doors, we pass out good literature, we build a strong grassroots movement which makes sure that every working person in this country does not vote in a big-time way against their own best interests. And and step by step, <laughs> we're going to make this garden grow, right, row by row. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. We'll be right back with more of our National Town Hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie, here on the Tom Harbin Program. And I promise you, kid, that I'll get so much more than I get. I just haven't met you yet. Welcome back, Tom Harmon here with you, and uh, Betty in Barry, Vermont, listening on WDEV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Mr. Sanders. Hi, Betty. I have a question for you. Do you plan in the future on having another town hall meeting in the central Vermont area? And the answer, Betty, is absolutely. Uh, do you know when that will be? Uh, we haven't scheduled it yet, but you as you know, we do, uh, we've done a number of meetings over the years in Montpelier, and we've done right, you have. as well yeah. in we certainly intend to be doing something in the near future. Okay. Uh, Devon in Blacksburg, Virginia, watching Direct TV on Free Speech TV. Devon, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Thanks for taking my call. Senator, I'm calling about um, an issue that concerns DOD contracting and the Buy American provision. Um, the Radford Army Ammunition Plant contract was awarded to a British company last year, BAE, in place of the American company, ATK. And two weeks ago, Michael Chertoff was elected chairman of the board of BAE. Now, it seems to me that the Senate ought to look into, um, you know, some undue influence here and, and why this British company is, is running this ammunition plant uh, and why Michael Chertoff is now the chairman of the board of that company. Uh, Devon, I think that's a very fair question. If you could send me some information at my office, we'll take a look at it. Uh, Pete in Rochester, New York, listening on, online on AM 10, 1090's stream. Pete, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Gentlemen, good afternoon, and thank you both. Senator, last year during the uh, debt ceiling debate, the uh, federal government, the administration, borrowed money from the Federal Employee Pension Fund. I want to know, has that money been repaid? I would ass- I can't think definitively, but if they borrowed it, I would assume that it had been paid. Bob in Clifton, Tennessee, listening on Sirius Satellite Radio. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Senator Sanders, my question is in two parts. In 1903, Judge Thomas D. Jones, during a peonage trial in Alabama, replied to two defendants who pled guilty but insisted that they did not know they were breaking the law, that, quote, the excuse that you did not know that you were violating the laws of the United States can have no legal weight, since every man is conclusively presumed to know the law. My question is, how many laws are there in the United States, and how many of them do you know? There are many laws in the United States of America, and I know some of them, but if your point is that there are thousands and thousands of laws, there surely are. Um, so, don't know what else to say about it. Okay. Dean in Battleground, uh, Washington, watches on Free Speech TV and Direct TV. Dean, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Bernie. Hey, how are you doing, Dean? Nice to talk to you. Uh, I was wondering if in the Senate, during the rules committees or doing the rules deal, that they might be able to put a limit on the filibusters, say to 80 to 100 for each side, and maybe that would take some of the stalemate out of the Senate. Well, the Senate has the ability to deal with filibusters in any way that it can, but uh, and that is a huge issue, and I know that's an issue that many people are concerned about. They want to know how one person, one United States senator, can literally stop the entire functioning of the United States government. It is a huge concern because we have seen in recent years Republicans abuse 
the process unmercifully. Uh, their goal has been to stop uh, anything progressive from being passed, stop Obama's initiatives, uh, and they what we have seen is just in the last few years more filibusters than in the many, many previous years combined. Uh, so the, what I would say to you, Dean, is there are a number of ideas out there on how we deal with the abuse of the filibuster, uh, and I certainly hope we're going to get to them as soon as we possibly can. Chris and Eugene, Oregon, listening on KPOJ. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi, Senator Sanders. Uh, thanks for doing the show. Uh, my question is, uh, when the government is looking at default again with all our debt, why is marijuana still illegal? Well, first of all, the government is not looking at default. You have right-wing Republicans who intend to use the debt ceiling as a uh, moment of opportunity uh, to cut programs that are desperately needed by working people, something that they always have wanted to do, but will use the threat of not paying our bills as a good excuse uh, to do it. So uh, it is not, quote-unquote, the government. It is right-wing extremists uh, who, after growing the deficit through two unpaid wars, tax breaks for the rich, deregulating Wall Street, they have now decided they want to cut Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and education. And what they're going to threaten the president with is to say, if you do not go along with these devastating cuts, which will hurt millions of people in the middle of a terrible recession, we're going to default. And we are going to, uh, and by defaulting, by not for the first time in the history of America, paying our bills, uh, we will probably uh, lead the very unstable financial situation of this world into even more instability. So that's where we are uh, right now. And uh, medical marijuana? And what medical marijuana? I think he was asking, you know, can we raise tax revenue with uh, with marijuana? Well, yeah, I think yeah. you 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 can, but the uh, there's a, a, quite a difference in magnitude here of what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay, Ed in West in Northwest Indiana, listening on or watching on Free Speech TV on Dish Network. Ed, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, um, I own a rural post office, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Sanders, and uh, we've had a couple uh, meetings between the post office and the, and do pretty good crowds throughout here in the country. I just got done talking to a truck driver, and this is my question. They're going to cut the uh, drivers and deliverers and the sorters down to part-time, and they'll lose their insurance benefits. Are you Were you aware of that? Uh, what well, I am aware, Ed, uh, you talk about postal employees? Yes, yes, I own a post office, and I'm very familiar. Okay. Uh, they've threatened to close me down. That's why I want to be anonymous to where I'm at. Okay. And what, uh, what, they, what the Postmaster General has proposed is that instead of shutting down rural post offices, he would reduce the hours. So it means going from, in some cases, 8 to 6 hours, in some cases, 8 to 4 hours. If he goes right. from 8 to 4 hours... Uh, not only will the people who run the post office see, uh, obviously, a loss of four hours a day of work, they're going to lose their benefits as well. If you go from eight to six, the post office postmaster remains, the title of postmaster remains, and benefits remains. That's my understanding of where we are at. Going from eight to four, you are going to lose all of your benefits, It is, and wages are going to go way down. Going from eight to six, uh, your wage per hour remains the same, and you keep your benefits, you lose two hours of work. Mm -hmm. okay. Joe in Chicago, Illinois, listening to WCPT, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yes, yeah, Senator Sanders, it's an honor to speak to you, sir. Um, my question is, uh, regarding the situation with the uh, one of the founders of Facebook, who uh, was leaving the country and moving to Singapore so that he could avoid capital gains tax on this the billions he made today. Mm -hmm. um, I have one, of, one of my right wing wacko friends tells me that there's that there isn't there's is a thing called an exit tax where someone renouncing their citizenship uh, has to pay a fifteen percent tax on all their assets if they renounce their citizenship no, and I don't, leave the country. No, that's not my understanding at all. And you know and to be honest with you, many people renounce their citizenship ship because they want to move to another country and you know, they want to go to Ireland or wherever they want to go. But in this case, for this particular fellow, he would made it very, very clear. Well, he has made huge sums of money uh, being in the United States, but he doesn't want to pay his American taxes. 
Uh, legislation has now just been introduced, which would uh, raise uh, his capital gains taxes, uh, which I you know, support. Uh, I think it is, it is really quite an outrage uh, for somebody to be quite as blatant as that and say, hey, thanks, Americans, for supporting me and allowing me to become a billionaire, but, uh, you know, I don't choose to pay my taxes. But you know what? This is just a more blatant example, uh, Joe, of what happens every single day. Uh, you have large corporations and wealthy people stashing their money in tax havens and Bermuda, the Cayman Islands, uh, all over the world, specifically and explicitly, uh, in order to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. Uh, and uh, in, instead of cutting, in my view, uh, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and all these other programs, uh, maybe we need to ask these uh, wealthy people and these large corporations uh, not to put their money in tax havens uh, and to pay their fair share of taxes. Because that is the, the, the refusal of the rich and the ability of the rich to use loopholes and all kinds of gimmicks to avoid paying their fair share is clearly one of the reasons we have the deficit situation we do today. Yeah, Bernie, we just have 40 seconds to the break here, Bernie. Do you think that there's going to be any serious effort to take on the, all these loopholes and, and things that rich people use in this legislative well, session? Some of us will, and some of us have. We just introduced legislation uh, last week, Keith Ellison and I, that would end uh, all of the tax breaks and subsidies and loopholes uh, that the fossil fuel industry enjoys. We don't think it makes a lot of sense that Exxon Mobil and these usually profitable corporations are able to take advantage of loopholes, which in many cases have prevented them from paying any federal tax in a given year. So, yes, yeah, some of us are doing it. But, again, you have a House of Representatives controlled by right-wing uh, extremists uh, who want more tax breaks for the rich, more tax breaks uh, for corporate America. So it is going to be hard to get legislation through both bodies. Yeah. Amen. And, and all the more reason why it's important to get involved politically. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour. Check out his website at sanders.senate.gov. And for the Bernie Buzz, you can sign his constitutional amendment, and it's a great news site. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. Sanders.Senate.gov. They update the news there constantly. It's a great news aggregating site as well. And welcome back, uh, Brian, in Phoenix, Arizona, watching on Dish TV, on Free Speech TV. You're on the air with uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. Senator Sanders, I appreciate you taking time to talk with me. I just have a really quick question for you, and maybe a long answer. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the Republicans trying to make it more difficult for people to vote by requiring IDs. Uh, just about everywhere and every facet of our life, we need to have an ID or provide some sort of identification for uh, being a U.S. citizen or being a resident of a state. Why are you so against somebody just being required to have that ID? I don't see where there's a major issue with that. You have to identify yourself when you're registered to vote. But what many many Republican states or or, uh, right-wing states are now doing, very intentionally, I mean, everybody understands it, despite the fact that there's virtually no vote afford, what they are now saying is um, not a question of ID. It's a question of, say, uh, we require you to have a photo uh, on your uh, driver's license. Well, that sounds reasonable if you have a driver's license. But if you're one of many people who don't have a car, a lower-income person who doesn't have a car, an elderly person who's not driving, you know what? You don't have that photo ID. Uh, and then it takes a bit of work to figure out how you're going to get a photo ID. You may have to pay for something. You may have to travel to another part of town to get it. But the end result of that effort, it's not a question that anybody can walk in and say, hey, I want to vote. No one is suggesting that. What we are suggesting is that if you are, if you are asking for identification, which a significant number of people don't have, that is discriminating uh, against folks, and, and the intent is pretty clear. It's to keep them from voting. Bernie, have I ever played my Paul Weyrich clip to you about this topic? I don't recall that I've if, heard it. If I may, I would love to Please. share this with you. We have just a few seconds. I think it'll fit in. This is Paul Weyrich. He was the one of the leaders of the Ronald Reagan campaign. He also was a leader in the George W. Bush campaign. 
uh, campaign strategist. He died a year or so ago. And this was a speech he gave in 1980 before a group of Republican activists in a, in a big mega church. Here he is. Now, many of our Christians have what I call the goo-goo syndrome, good government. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. And that's that's exactly well. Give him credit for being honest. Yeah. Uh, well, what he the didn't Republicans realize. Republicans want, and what this whole voter suppression is about, and what Brian should understand, is what Republicans want is to make it as hard as possible for lower income people, working people, minorities, elderly people, uh, to vote, because they understand that many of those people will vote against a right-wing ideology which wants to give tax breaks to billionaires and cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, education, etc. All right. And, and I, you know, for my part, I'm just trying to carry, I, I've, I've been playing that Paul Weyrich clip for years and years on this program, and, you know, just to tell people, this, there's actually a Republican strategy. And, in oh, fact, absolutely. there's... there's, there's I mean, people should not... And the other side of the strategy is the Citizens United. Yeah. Term is you have unlimited amount of money coming in from billionaires and corporations. Add those things together, and the Republicans are, uh, move forward very significantly in yeah. terms of the election process. Yep. Absolutely. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. We'll be right back with more of your calls for Bernie. Welcome back. It's Brunch with Bernie, the our national town hall meeting here on the Tom Hartman program, and Francine in Little Elm, Texas. You're on the air with Senator Bernie Sanders. Hi, my name is Fran, and uh, yes, Bernie, I thought that the post office was uh, self sufficient by, like, for example, the post post uh, stamps that they so sell. Um, but my husband and I have always thought that it was a uh, uh, government. Government's trying to take over the post office so that, so that it is another governmental uh, form that they can control over, and not that so much the postal service was actually in trouble. It's just that the government wanted to no. take it over, like they have Medicare and Medicaid. Oh, 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 okay, uh, Francine, <clears throat> let me just start off by saying. Government hasn't taken over Medicare. Medicare is a government program. That's what it is. And I know sometimes people get confused about that, but Medicare is funded by the United States government. It started that way. Right. Uh, Medicaid is a government state, uh, federal state program. In terms of the Postal Service, Francine, uh, the Postal Service was a government agency, I think, until the 19... 19- 70s. Tom, if you know that correctly. I, I don't know the year, but and, it's in that and neighborhood. Which it made a, a, a radical change. So instead of being a government agency, it became, as, as Francine indicates, self-sufficient, i.e. it is supported by the revenue it raises through taxes, through, uh, not through taxes, through uh, stamps and, and, and the delivery of mail and packages. So Francine, it is not a question of the government wanted to take it over. Uh, it is self-sufficient, but it is related to the government in that many of the employees uh, get their benefits uh, through the government, uh, through a federal uh, employee retirement system, uh, and the government does have uh, it, the federal, the postal service is uh, in the Constitution of the United States. So yeah, the government yeah. certainly does have a lot to say about it. It was started in the George Washington administration. That's right. <laughs> as a government it's agency. The Constitution. It's yeah. an obligation to maintain universal uh, delivery. So this is not a question of the government trying to take over. What we're dealing with right now is the Postmaster General, uh, about nine or ten months ago, came up with a rather draconian proposal to shut down many, many, many thousands of rural post offices and about half of the processing plants in the country. Many of us in Congress responded against that, and uh, we're working on 
figuring out how we can best protect rural post offices and uh, in a decent mail delivery standard. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Bill in Fire Lake, Minnesota, watching us on Free Speech TV on Dish TV, <coughs> or Direct TV, excuse me. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Senator Sanders. Thanks for taking our calls. But I just was, um, have a suggestion for our friends on the other side of the aisle. Where they always tell us about Social Security being an um, entitlement. Why don't they present the retirement as leaders that their retirement would be the same as the military? After 30 years, they can draw half their pay or a third of their pay, and then from there on, see how well they like the entitlement programs. Well, that's an, that's an interesting uh, suggestion. Uh, but I would just say, and you know, uh, Tom, uh, on Tuesday I was at a rally uh, held outside the Andrew Mellon Building uh, in D.C., uh, sponsored by the um, by a number of groups. Uh, in protest to a uh, conference that was being held uh, by uh, Pete Peterson, who's a, a billionaire fellow who's been working very hard to cut Social Security. And uh, our position was that Social Security is not in crisis. Social Security is a $2.7 trillion surplus. can pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American for the next 22 years. And we've got to work to make it strong for the next 75 years. Uh, but we are going to do everything that we can uh, to defend Social Security, which is so enormously important uh, to people in this country. It should not be cut. It should not be privatized. It should be strengthened. James in Bonita Springs, Florida. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Senator Sanders, it's a honor to talk to you. Um, <clears throat> I signed your petition for the amendment. And um, Hello? Yeah, You're on right, yeah, thank you very much okay. for signing. I thought, yeah, and, but it occurred to me that the solution may already be in the Constitution, and here's how it works. If a corporation is a person, it's entitled to the protection of the 13th Amendment, which, as you know, freed the slaves, and basically said one person cannot own another person. Therefore, all we have to do is emancipate the corporations. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, James. Well, well let me... Uh, <laughs> Uh, on a more practical uh, level, uh, let me say that, uh, first of all, I appreciate it. We have over 200,000 signatures uh, on that uh, petition to overturn Citizens United. And that tells me that all over this country, people are profoundly disgusted with the Supreme Court ruling that said corporations are people and that corporations can spend as much money as they want uh, in elections. Uh, what I hope, that's going to be a long haul to get uh, a constitutional amendment passed. Short term, my hope is that within the next month or two, what we will, what we will be seeing on the floor of the Senate uh, is a legislation called the Disclose Act, which says that any corporation that is spending money on a campaign is going to have to, among other things, have their CEO up there on the screen saying, as every candidate has to say, I approve this message. So if some corporation is putting money into some horrendous, ugly, negative ads, that CEO is going to have to be up there. And you know what? That CEO is not going to do that because they don't want to turn off millions of people who otherwise would buy their products. Hmm. So I think that would be a huge step forward. I hope we can win that. I hope we can get a few Republican votes so that uh, in order to, among other things, allow the American people to know who is paying for some of these terrible ads they're seeing on their TV screens. Didn't the Disclose Act, the last time it hit the Senate, get 51 votes? I mean, that, that should be a majority. Well, that takes us back to another issue, and that is how the Republicans demand 60 votes now for almost every piece of legislation. I don't remember the exact vote count. Okay. I believe we did not get any Republican support. Yeah, okay. Senator Bernie Sanders, Bernie, thanks so much for being with us. Good to be with you. Take care.